I want to focus on the impact that the influx of oral therapies may have had on this clinical decision-making process. So now's your chance to jump in. Okay, so this is a very important point. The immunosuppressive agents that permanently increase risk for PML, if you've had any length of time prior treatment, were for the most part cytotoxic agents. None of the three oral agents are cytotoxic. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, they're not for the most part even necessarily considered immunosuppressive. They're called immunomodulatory. So you're right, we don't have the answer to whether use of any of the three uh, would increase risk for PML if you subsequently go on natalizumab. My own feeling would be they're not in the category of cytotoxic agents like mitoxantrone and cyclophosphamide and even azathioprine and methotrexate, which seems to be the drugs that put people at risk. But, but that being said, yeah. there have been reported cases of PML in patients treated they, with some no, agents <laughs> very Fingolamide. similar to they, these. No, no, no. Hold on, I'm even going to just talk I'm about back up a little bit here. Right? This is so even dimethylfumarate <laughs> and that, That's a whole, that category. Those were, those were psoriasis patients. Don't yes, talk to me unless it's but, an MS patient. But hold on, PML. hold on. Conceptually, no. you can get a suppression of white blood cell counts that can be significant with these medications. Clyde, I agree that with that. Might put you at a risk. But we never had PML in Not MS yet. We despite didn't have PML, multiple agents. But we didn't have PML before we had until PML. Until natalizumab. Right? There's something about natalizumab and MS that makes you vulnerable. Yeah, so no question that natalizumab is, is the key factor. In, in people with MS uh, getting PML because as Pat says, we never saw it before. That said, we never had these agents before uh, and we never had this sort of sequencing of what, what somebody took before and now they go on natalizumab. And, and I agree with Clyde on this point that um, you know, we know some of the agents that seem to amplify the risk in the natalizumab treated patients. We don't know yet whether or not the newer oral agents uh, will be amplifiers of risk. Pat could be right that right. they, that and, they and won't be, I but I, I, I think, case, I, but and I hope that's know. the case. Well, but immunosuppressive we don't know. is the weakest data for the risk stratification. But let's take, weak. let's take a look. I'm sorry. Mr. I was just going to add that we, we don't really know why those agents increase the PML risk years down the road when patients are on natalizumab tisabri. So I think the mechanism by which immune suppression later engenders a higher risk is really unclear, and it may be something that these new oral agents do confer, and maybe something that they don't. I don't think we're gonna know it until a few more years pass, and we'll be able to include those into the risk stratification model. But there are some other risks, too, that I don't wanna just gloss over, right? Whenever you're talking about the risks and benefits of, of current and future oral agents, uh, you wanna compare them to the risks of those agents that are administered traditionally by injection or infusion. So we have the relapse rate of the disease itself, uh, disability progression, opportunistic infections, uh, neutralizing antibodies, cardiac adverse effects. So how do you, how do you sort all that out, Pat? I'm a, a fan of the oral agents. I think the interesting thing about the oral agents is that in their limited head-to-head -head trials, and each one of them has a head-to-head -head trial with, uh, with one of the original parenteral agents, they, the efficacy was as good or better. So you're not uh, getting rid of efficacy in taking the oral agent. The trade-off is that you don't have 20 plus year history with the drug. You don't have the same enormous number of MS patient years treated. And so it's very hard to say that you can absolutely exclude that there might not be some nasty surprise as you build up on the number of MS patients who are treated. That having been said, we've had the first oral fingolimod since uh, 2010. Uh, we've had teraflunamod now since 2012. We've had dimethylfumarate since 2013. And we're kind of getting a feel for what their adverse effects are. And by and large, they're pretty safe. Some wrinkles with regard to herpes infections with, um, with fingolimod, but they really don't appear to be major at all. Well, also, issues uh, related to uh, concerns for pregnancy to some degree for some of these neural oral agents because some of them might be in category X or... Um, Big deal. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you know, these are issues that we have to address in our population who have, um, you know, childbearing uh, concerns. So, you know, that is definitely a, an issue. Some of the medications cause significant elevation in liver enzyme abnormalities. You have to monitor for that. Um, and some of the medications, you have to worry about some of their comorbi comorbidities. Mm -hmm. you know, I want, like I want to come back to the, the liver enzyme abnormalities because that's come up with the statins, too. And the consensus has been with the statins that LFT abnormalities is not necessarily liver synthetic dysfunction. 
and that in fact maybe you're just going to have to live with an elevated bilirubin or an AST and call it a day. You know, by and large, the, the liver issues have not been, been major issues with the orals at all. You do check them, you can see them up, but they've not been issues. And frankly, teraflunamide, which has a black box warning because of the rheumatoid arthritis drug, leflunamide, when you review the data, it didn't deserve a black box warning, to be honest. It really didn't. You hardly see anything. All right, so now we have a disease.